So when I say now, it's going to be 11. Now. So welcome to this session, which is a lecture called Sympathy for Data by Stefan Larsson from Combine, a consultancy firm here in Gothenburg. Sympathy for Data is a visual data flow programming platform built in Python. So please welcome. working in the automotive industry for almost 15 years for this. And what I'm going to show you now originates from the automotive industry. I can't say exactly the company I came from, but it, it's not part of trucks or anything, so you can hear that. Um, first, I'm going to give a background on the problem, a uh, short technology overview, a demonstration, and then some some, some conclusions and some words about the future, because this is still work in progress. How many of you recognize this? How many of you have actually been working in a large enterprise organization? Some of you. So you recognize this problem that this is just scaled down. Now. So it's, it's a small subset of a large organization. And you might have one employee over here. And, uh, I'm not sure why, but there's an employee over here which is not visible right now. And when those two people write code, they are totally unaware of each other. So they don't know what the other one is doing. So there is huge possibility here for rework and redoing code all, all, the, all, of, all of the time. And even within one group in, in the organization, we were about 25 people for our work. And some of us did the same things all the time. So, trying to solve this, in 2009, I and another guy started coding uh, during evenings and weekends. So we started at work at 6.30 in the morning. At 15.12 we could go to the clock and get out of the company and go home and start coding till 10 in the evening. And this was very exhausting, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, had, we had a vision that if we could build blocks which could be reusable and connected together visually, we could reuse the code and we could uh, improve uh, the efficiency in how we would write this code in, in an for, for in, in engineering context. Um, but before starting doing such, such a type of work, we learned afterwards that this was of major importance. You must know who owns the result depending on the contract you have with your employee. Because in some cases what you write might automatically be the property of the, of the, of the employer. If this is an expected output from your normal job. We were lucky because this was not part work. Uh, normal job. So we were able to determine the, um, how we wanted to do this and how, um, uh, under what circumstances, we wanted to publish this code. So we decided uh, we were thinking about starting a company, of course, but we didn't find a good business model, and uh, it was too too far far away from the market. So. We decided to go to an employer and ask for time to do this. And we were trying to sell this to them. So we had to have the company lawyers on our side. And that, that included teaching them about open licenses and open source software, because this is completely unknown in most companies. Uh, everything is so proprietary, everything is so secret, that no one wants to share anything. Um, we had to think about maintenance of the code. Because we had a large problem in the organization that engineers started writing tools for themselves. And these tools uh, were very dependent on these individuals. So if they changed position in the company, or if they changed jobs, this code was lost. They deleted the account and they shared this account was removed and nothing was working anymore. And we never got past the prototype stage, so this was very hard for others to, to, to use. Uh, we never got to an industri industrialization. 
Also, ensuring function was a good argument because we were producing a lot of very expensive and proprietary tools and trying to get other um, tools to, to work the way we wanted was very difficult because either the support never answered uh, or they were very unwilling to change the software because they said we are not using the software the way it was intended to be used. And um, in most cases where I was man managed to do anything with this software was to dis disassemble parts of it to understand how it worked and then change the interface slightly. This was of course not allowed according to the license of the software. Uh, we were discussing the ownership of the software. And um, we wanted, based on the previous um, experiences where prototypes were lost due to, 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 to being locked to certain individuals, we wanted to have an independent ownership. We were looking around the world, they are usually non-profit organizations often called foundations, and in Sweden there's nothing similar to a foundation in that sense. So we, we started something called an ideal training, which I can't find any translation for in English, but it's kind of a non-profit organization. So we wanted to put all the copyright of the software in this organization. Um, my, my employer was very worried about warranty of responsibility, worried if, if the software was, wasn't working, were they responsible for, for taking care of the problems? And of course it wasn't because if the license says there's no warranty. And we had to do a lot of talking and convincing about code contribution that any code of rights should be contributed for the, for the better good so we can share results between companies. Uh, with that background, and this journey was made during 2010 and partly during 2011, so it took a lot of time to do this before we got the company on our side. Uh, so if you're going to do this in your own companies, where, where you work, you have to be prepared to go talk to all these stakeholders, especially lawyers. So, big data is a very trendy word right now, and has been for a couple of years. Uh, there are four issues listed by Gartner, the, the analysis company, and that's volume. And this is what happens all the time in the engineering community. Uh, we have storage problems, we have memory problems over indivi individual computers, and we have a problem of distributing the, uh, the data between people. Velocity, that's about how, how quickly you get results from, data, from analysis of data. Um, usually, it, when they talk in the, in the business about this, it's about Twitter, and they want responses or results in milliseconds, just to see if someone tweeted about this. Uh, in the engineering community, this could be going from one month to one week instead. That's a good velocity improvement, or maybe not one day to get results. Variety is said on the web in many, many sources, but this is the dubious problem you have in, in data analysis, and that's you have so many data sources, and you have so many data structures, and you have to build readers for all these data structures. Uh, this is often a stopper for many people, because they can't get the data into their analysis systems. Sometimes the file formats are even proprietary, so it's not documented at all. You don't know how to read it. And veracity, this is nothing you really can do so much about um, unless you verify data or, or something. That's the truth or the accuracy of the data. How, how much can you trust the data in the beginning? I read a book last week. It has a very good chart here about the difference between what they call business intelligence and data science, which is the new trendy area to go into. Uh, the value in business value and time here is what, what type of data you're analyzing. So for business intelligence, you have a rel relatively low business value and you look mostly at past what? data, not doing that much predictions about the future. 
what will come. When you do data science, you will usually have a higher business value because you will start looking more into the future and not that much on what happened and trying to find actions and decisions in the future based on the data. So usually they think about it as business intelligence being something in retrospective and data science about forward thinking. So there are different stages you can go through in data analysis. You start with a low business value and that's uh, looking at how many, how often, and, and what happened. Um, counting, aggregating data, it's not that much value. So you can look at these results and start asking yourself, how did we do based on these results? And the big question, why did this happen? Trying to trace back why the results are like they are. And it's very easy to get stuck here, but you should really continue pushing forward to get Look at the trends, what happens if you continue, and finally getting to what is my next step, what's the next action I will do. Because that's when you monetize on the, on the data. Really. Uh, if you look at the web shop, the final step here is really when, when you start shopping things and it starts predicting what you're going to shop next and give that as an opportunity for you to select correctly without you understanding that you want it. So when we look at the differences between how you do data analysis between data science and business intelligence. So in business intelligence, you start usually with well-formed data sources. You have data warehouses and well-formed databases. And you do something called extract, transform, load. You analyze it and report it. When you do data science, you can, have, of course, have these type of data sources. You also can have files. You can have like anything. And then we do something called extract load transform instead of extract trans, uh, transform load. And this means that you extract the data, you load it, and then transform it when you have all the data on site. Um, you go on, you do the analysis modeling, you report, you predict, and you try to get an action out of it instead of just reporting what happened and what, the, what does the data look like. So looking at how I as an engineer used to work, and still do in, in some senses, is you have the several data sources. It could be measurement systems, it could be databases, anything. And you imported this using a script, and this could take some time to execute. So you didn't want to do it when you downstream was debugging what you were doing then. So I usually exported it to a file. Then I cleaned the data, grouped it, and what I had to do to make it fit the interface of my analysis algorithm. And finally, I, I generated the plots. And experience all the time is that this step is like 80-90% of the work. The rest is very easy. And actually, this first step is extract the transform. If you look at commercial software, you can start here and go there. They skip this step and assume that you've already, already done it before. Most engineers use Excel for everything. It's a de facto data analysis software. So you can read everything to a, a, a table, given the limits of the number of rows you have in the system. Um, they have manual labor, they copy paste, they use the mouse and keyboard all the time, sets it for weeks doing this. Uh, if you can't read the data, you're, you don't do anything. So it's never done. So if we scale this to several engineers, they are on the black side there. They usually do the same things in parallel with the same data sources. And if I want to take this, guy, this guy's data import here, and, and couple it here, it won't work because my interface is not similar to this interface. It would probably take shorter time for me to rewrite and adapt everything to the data format for the exchange between this. So, what we thought was, why not start reusing this in some sense? So we only have difference in where it actually differs and try to have a similar data interface between these 
components where it where it's the same thing all the time. So based on what we call the Pareto principle is that we do 20% of the work to get 80% of the results. We focus on this ELT uh, problem. So we have some basic requirements. The first was to have an isolated execu execution environment for each operation. So we don't have uh, problems in functionality when you continue developing things and pollute the environment. Uh, we needed to design a data type system for inputs and outputs of these isolated operations. So we have well-defined data, so we know what's coming in there and what's going out. So we had to design a type system. We went to the library of re reusable components such that we could save time for, uh, for these common operations all the time such that we could improve these operations, not rewriting them from scratch all the time. And the real problem here is to actually find a good granularity for these operations. So they're not mini apps or too low, it's, it's like additions. It, it, it should be the correct uh, level. And also we had to build a graphical editor to build these data flow graphs to make it accessible to users who are not actually programmers, which are engineers. So, just to show you something, the result was this tool. And Sympathy for Data was a name we came up with, with as a working name because we felt sympathy for all the data which is left untouched, and never analyzed. It stuck because we didn't find a better name. So, what we have here is a library of things. And here we have in bad focus uh, different, different blocks, as we call them, and we connect them so we get the the data flow through this graph. So the platform is based on Python. <coughs> the reason for choosing Python is that we come from a world where MATLAB is king. Have all of you met MATLAB and used it? Yeah, a lot of people. Uh, MATLAB is a real problem right now because they're using floating licenses usually and trying to get a license after lunch is equal to not getting a license. So you can't work for one hour until someone releases the license. So we found out in the mid 2000s that there were computation libraries which were quite good for Python. Um, specifically NumPy and SciPy. And there are lots of computational and floating libraries to choose from in this community. Uh, maybe the performance wasn't that good compared to MATLAB in some senses. Some types could be better, but it depended, uh, dependent, was dependent on how it was compiled and what computation libraries it were used and so on. Um, we decided to use HDF5 for storage of intermediate data. Um, HDF5 is used by NASA, I think, uh, Livermore Labs, and, and a couple of other large places in the US. Um, so in, uh, in uh, Switzerland, I think they are, and the big accelerator, they are producing huge amounts of data. They, they are discussing to use HDF5, but they have and formal called x root invented internally, so they, they want to use something which they invented themselves. It's a very similar format. Um, does everyone know what HDF5 is? Or is, is there anyone who has never seen it? Uh, it's actually a hierarchical data format where you can put data sets in like a, like a virtual file system. So you can store data in a tree structure. And you can put tables, you can put columns and you have a quite quite good free form where you're working with the data. And it's quite quick to, to, to read and write, especially read. It's very easy to read the subsets of the data. You can also link between files in a, several steps. So you can expose what's in another file in 
the profit, like the virtual link. Um, we decided to use Qt, or Qt, and especially the binding called PySign. This is kind of difficult to work with, I think, because it's very easy to get segmentation calls, and it's not that mature compared to PyQt, which is, has commercial support. But um, we decided to use it because of more liberal licenses. We started working in C++, we, we switched to Python because of the development rate. It's a bit slow to, to write the uh, user interface in C++. Uh, regarding the design of the platform, we decided we, we should not use feedback loops. So we, we build graphs without loops, we, we only build graphs which are open. Uh, so we rely on list recursion. So we make lists and we try to iterate on lists instead. Um, and also, we introduced the pipe system because we thought tables are not enough. If we are looking at several other programs or softwares before starting this development to try to find are there any softwares working on the market now, right, right now, which are solving our problems, but all of them are using tables. We don't think tables are enough for, for engineering data. If you have time series, mixed with tables and metadata, uh, you can have videos, you can have images, you can have sound, you can have anything, and tables are not enough for you. So you have to, to handle that. So right now we have two basic data types which we call text and table. We decided not to go down on double, integer, and, and so on. We decided to use more like high level data types because it's easy for the user to understand. We thought about in the future to use images, sound, uh, a movie could be a list of images, for example. And um, we also added some containers. We have list containers, we can have lists of these things. We have records, which are essentially named tuples, and dictionaries, which only have string keys. Uh, in this case. So just an example of how the type could be defined. Um, the parentheses are defining the record, and we have three fields called description, data, and property. Uh, the description is a text, the data is a list of tables, the property is a dictionary of named tuples with the fields F1 and F2, which are text and table. So I can inherit these types in the next type, for example, so I just use a list of type 1 here. So this way I can build data types which match the application I'm working with or the context I'm working with. Um, I will demonstrate the software later on, but it looks something like this when you build a simple flow. So in order to execute this, we have we start a, a set of workers when we start the program. And we have a scheduler which puts the work on different workers. It's quite simple right now. Nothing fancy that way. But we get some kind of multi-threading in, in Python but in, by starting processes. So I'm going to show you what it looks like right now. small screen. So a very, very very simple example here which is not really representative for what the real applications we are doing but it, it shows what can be done in, in a short time. So first I define a data source in this case. And this data source has a symbol which is a branch and it says it needs to be configured. Uh, we have a symbol out here saying that this data type out here is a type of data source. Uh, we will run out of geometrical configures 
in the future. So we, we're thinking about how to solve this with many types. Uh, so we can choose file, or we can choose a SQL server uh, as a data source in there right now. So in this case, So I just execute this one and as an output here, right now I just have a file name. So it's it's a way of defining a, a data source. Uh, then I have to parse this data to actually read it into something. which translates the data source into a table right now. And I have, we have several importers to use here, and we have a plugin system to introduce new importers for, for something representing the table data. In this case, we have a CSV. So you can choose, this is inspired from several other applications that have been using, but so we can be very flexible because CSVs are never well defined in most cases. Uh, the first row can start at any row. And so we can choose where we have headers, if we have units, and if we have descriptions for each column. And we can say where which row to start at. And we can also choose encoding and the delimiters and so on. So we can make this simple. It's also possible to use output to try to sniff files for me. No, it's not always it succeeds, but sometimes it does. Um, I have a resolution problem here, I'm trying to find the OK button. <laughs> Not sure. So we have to move this window without. High resolution screen and push a case. I think I'll do it like this if I encounter this again. So what I did now was to read this data. And this data is based on, on uh, advertisements I extracted when I was going to sell my car once in 2009. Uh, so I was scraping this advertisement site called Lockbit in Sweden to find car makes, uh, year, price, and where when I first saw the car and when it was removed so I could see how fast it was sold with. Really. Uh, it's not that much data, it's 3,772 rows. Uh, so what I could do is try to look at this in the scatter plot. As you see here, we have a design problem right now because we have to build one scatter plot for each data type. 
to go to try to introduce some kind of more dynamic type, like an any type, to reduce the number of blocks we have, because it's kind of difficult to find the blocks right now, because there's so many. <coughs> Yes. And we still have a resolution problem. So, on the x-axis, I, I could want come on here in this case, and I want to look at the price. And as you see here, the veracity of the data is not that good because we have a year requiring 3,900 something. <laughs> this could be a trick to get the car in the first of the list. When, when you search for advertisements, or if it's simply a human error. So what I would like to do now is filter this. So I would select rows and table. This is a really simple operation, just filtering out what I want. Uh, so in this case, I want to filter here to be less than 2010, and this would remove five rows. Apparently, there was some more illegal data in there. Uh, I could remove this one. Um, connect it here again, and I can look at the filter data. So now it looks more, a bit more sane, and we also have a very old car here from the 60s, which is sold as a bargain for you. Uh, th this just simply illustrates how you could work with it and, and combine things. Um, the applications we have been building are far more advanced than this. And, and we are building custom blocks here as well. So in the end here, we usually now just export the data to the database or the table or something like that and import it in the existing tools for analysis. And when we feel that we want to implement uh, the analysis in here, we do it then and only then. We don't try to build blocks just to build them because it's fun, because we only try to build them as we traverse from the data source to the results. And if there's a block missing, we build it on the way. And then have it in the library. So most of the blocks are actually in the beginning in the extract load transform phase because that's the most common uh, operations we have for, for the different applications we have developed. So let's go back here again. So, this tool was born because, as I said, nothing on the market was fulfilling what we needed. Uh, as I said, they only work with wild form tables, and data has to be pre-processed to be able to be imported in the, into these tools. There are some simple filtering mechanisms sometimes. It's, it's not always even possible to read it. It could be illegal characters. It could be empty cells, which are not, it could be a star for an empty cell, but the star is not allowed in that software, so you have to change it to something else, and it could be anything strange. We also found it faster and cheaper to adapt our own platform for our own needs, um, compared to going to, to a large vendor to say, develop this for us, because that would be really expensive for this type of software, and would take a lot of time, and you would never get what you wanted in there. Uh, we, many engineers are not what we call multi-instrumentalists. Multi they don't, they can't move between computing environments. If they're good at MATLAB, they want to use MATLAB for everything. If they're good at R, they want to use R for everything. Uh, we have, we have the possibility to actually mix these by, by building workers for different environments. We have only Python right now, but we could, could build a worker for R, could build a worker for MATLAB. We have a single MATLAB. At that would block right now, actually. Uh, and uh, we, could, we could mix all these environments 
So if someone is good at writing an analysis routine in R and have the libraries there, you can actually build it there and then share with other guys who write the Python code or the MATLAB code or anything like that. And the final motivation, of course, was that we were young, stupid, and uh, had personal interest and commitment in this. Uh, if you have done something like this, you will never want to do it again. <laughs> it's good that there are young people growing up all the time. Currently, we are powering several customer applications. I can't go into real detail because this is their intellectual property. Uh, but we have done a lot of automation on manual ELT workflows. So we have people sitting doing manual labor, collecting files from tests manually and analyzing them and putting them into a report. We have automated that and saving a lot of time from hours now down to minutes. We have one application working with failure and warranty prediction. Um, also, we are replacing a lot of outdated MATLAB scripts, saving licenses in that case, uh, and also re-implementing. They had a problem with MATLAB being updated and then the script stopped working because there wasn't the compatibility within scripts. Uh, this is an example of a commercial workflow which I try to anonymize as much as possible, but you see the structure. So over here you have the extract load transform base going into the simple analysis column and then aggregation of the data and exporting it for further analysis. So this actually proves once again that this extract load transform stage is, is not to be ignored really. This is another example of two flows which are doing essentially the same thing but in different domains. I can't say much more than that. But what I want to illustrate here is that I'm coloring the box here with the box which are, have the same color on the same box, really. So this shows the, the amount of reuse you could use between these instead of writing this separately and having to maybe think about writing a class libraries or something like that, too. So it's not that much which has to be rewritten. Of course, the first application which goes out and does something here have to have a huge penalty because they have to implement everything because it's an empty library. But the more they're going in there, the less work they have to do. So for the future, we, we need to work on some important areas. We, we have to build a mature development environment. It's, it's quite difficult to get people up and running. They have to work with a pure editor or something like that. Um, it, it has to be more streamlined to, to attract less experienced people into this environment. Uh, interactive work. This is a really important thing which you haven't focused that much in. And that's when you build the flow, if we have something to draw with. For example, if you start importing something and go to the next level, I've seen applications where you just drag something up, the, the connection up here and drop it, and then you get the menu what you can do. For example, you can start an interactive environment, which would mean that you take this data, load it into a workspace, and um, <coughs> in this workspace, you can do anything you want. You sit with a prompt and you do experiments with the data, you look at the data. And uh, once you're done, <coughs> you just dump this into a script and then you move on. So, this is something we're looking at, do, which means that if, if you don't have a block here, you can just drag it out, start an environment, just write some simple code to get you going into the next step. As I said, we want to clean up the library with any type, uh, reduce the number of blocks. Uh, we want to introduce higher order functions. So we, we're looking a lot of, at Haskell and similar languages to try to embrace these. Uh, sorry, type of functions I was looking for. We want a type, function type which leads to higher order functions. Uh, we found that often we develop things for the singular case. So we, we do the analysis for one element. And then it's very easy to scale to several elements. So you just do the same thing for, for all of them. Um, we must improve the performance. 
it's, uh, we have a large overhead right now by writing files between all the books. Um, we, we thought when we started designing this that in the future disk space will be infinite almost and cheap, but it's still slow. And we see something like a 70% overhead on file access right now. We have to find a way to optimize this. And finally, we need to polish this. It's still quite rough, and uh, the user interface, any, any of you who have written graphical user interfaces know that it's a lot of work. And it's a lot of polishing, and there's a lot of states which can can go wrong. So that's all I have to say about this right now, so I, I open for questions. So first, let's thank the speaker. And we open the floor for any questions. Yeah. Uh, which kind of license do you use? Um, is it free as in beer or in We're using a GPL version 3 license and uh, using a DSD license for basic files which you're using for uh, the blocks because we predicted that we might need to link to proprietary libraries, for example. But that, uh, so is it free as a beer? Can I download this? Yes, you can download it. You just search the web and you will find it. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> uh, which uh, competitors do you see? Like RapidMiner? Uh, yeah, RapidMiner is a, a huge um, inspiration source. And also Knime, which is the Constance Miner, which also is open source as well. Yes, all my uh, ETL tools as well, like uh, uh, yeah, we have looked a bit at Pentaho, but we haven't seen that maybe it's not a one to one match. No, I guess not, not there. Just uh, look at the IBM modeler, it's not that similar either. There are small differences between them, different applications and different contexts which, where they're working. Obviously. Yeah? Um, you mentioned some export functionality, which we were quite brief on that. Could you elaborate on what kind of exports you can do? Is uh, it right. like the importer, essentially, yeah. or? Yeah, CSV, Excel, um, we have something called MDF, which is um, Automotive Measurement File System. Can you export to SQL? To what? To SQL database? Yeah, database. you can do that. You can also export to the raw HDF file file. And uh, another question I have is, you started out with uh, two developers, right? Wait, what? With, you started out with, you started the project with two developers in yes. spare time. Um, what does the current community look like? And is there any interaction from outside the company? Do you have mailing lists? Or what is your project? Uh, we, we have intentionally not wanted to build a community from the start because we didn't want to go out before we felt it was mature enough. So you could say that this is a starting step. Okay. Chain-based coding. <laughs> Chain-based. Yeah. Yeah. And do you, are you considering that? Are you are you really thinking about it, or are you just going to let it happen somehow? Or we we want to build a community really, because that would make the software more robust yeah. for changes if you know the bus factor. Right. right. If someone gets killed by a bus. <laughs> uh, currently, we are four developers, core developers, at the combine. And we are funded mainly through customer contracts, support maintenance, and uh, developing features uh, and functionality and applications as well. And does the nonprofit um, that you founded sort of have oversight over community issues as well as the copyright? Like, I mean, what would happen if people actually start contributing? Is it still something that your employer would be worried about, or is it something that you already sort of sorted out? Of we sorted out all the, all of these with lawyers already. So my former employer has donated code to this nonprofit organization, and we at Combine are also donating code. And we try and get more companies in there. And where do you host the code and the project infrastructure that's there? Uh, we have an internal uh, structure right now, but we mm -hmm. we we publish it. We we are using Bitbucket a lot previously, but uh, we're using Mercurial for version. Right. Us on. So, are there any more questions from the audience? Yeah.
Yes, one more. Uh, so I got several more, but I could probably take them out of Okay. But I mean, the, the Hadoop uh, uh, frameworks, do you have anything, uh, any connections? Can you import data from the HDFS? Or? We are not looking at Hadoop because we think that Hadoop is not good for engineering applications. Uh, Hadoop is good for business intelligence where you count aggregate data. Uh, if you're going to calculate eigenvalues or invert matrices and so on, or just do a line regression or something like that for, for data, Hadoop is no good anymore, unless you do a lot of them in parallel. But if you have lots of data and want to do a line regression, I've seen from Microsoft Research uh, an, an example of how you can do it, and it's not very simple. It's not like just backslash in, in math. <laughs> All right, so let's thank the speaker again.